Good afternoon. This is Erica Berg. I am the uh, current chair of the dispute resolution section, joined today by Sean Momin, who's the executive officer of Aga Khan International Conciliation and Arbitration. He is also the secretary of our section, and I want to thank him for working um, with our speaker today, Ray Chadwick, regarding our program. I will note that we had applied for professionalism CLE, but unfortunately we were not successful in getting that CLE. We have been approved for one general CLE hour. We will be looking at opportunities to put in um, a professionalism CLE going forward. So I do apologize for that, that we won't be able to offer that today. But I am nonetheless very excited that Ray Chadwick is with us today. Um, Ray is a, a local boy in many respects. He went to Emory University, uh, but he earned his JD at the University of Virginia Law School. After that, he went and served as a captain in the U.S. Uh, Air Force and where he was a trial lawyer. After 30 some odd years as a litigator, uh, in Georgia, uh, Ray decided to become a full-time mediator and arbitrator, and he's been doing that since 2010, um, racking up a lot of kudos for his work. I'm pleased to say he's a former chair of our section, and he's been um, staying very involved with us as uh, one of the members of our executive committee. So I'm very excited mm -hmm. to have Ray here today because he is a very accomplished mediator. He's a former um, participant in the commission uh, for, for Georgia's Office of Dispute Resolution on the committee. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. And I think you can take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Erica. Um, this topic, and I think uh, if, uh, John, if you could pull up the first slide for a moment. Good, I hope everybody can see that. Um, the, um, and, uh, then we can, uh, well, I'll, I'll comment on the second slide in just a minute. Um, this topic came up when Eric and I first met by Zoom, not in person as yet, and we were talking about what could be done in terms of continuing uh, legal education. And I don't remember exactly why, but I just commented on the existence of these uh, the Supreme Court rules on uh, dispute resolution. And as we talked about it, Eric has suggested that we do something that uh, the section do something where we could talk about those and she volunteered me. So uh, here we are and I'm glad to be doing this. This some might think this could be a bit of a, a dry topic uh, and that could include me, I guess. But it's really an important topic because these rules uh, really have widespread application across Georgia and control really court-related ADR programs across the state. And I'll be getting into some of the details on that. Um, the, uh, the focus of this is, and I guess, Sean, Sean we can go to the next uh, slide. The focus of this really, although it mentions the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act, I'll be talking a little bit about that in relationship to these rules, but the focus really be on, will really be on the rules because uh, our impression is that a lot of folks aren't really all that familiar with them. Um, I don't recall the program ever being done on them before, and uh, but I, again, I'll see, I think you'll see that it's very important. Well, with regard to the Supreme Court's alternative dispute resolution rules and their relationship to the uh, Georgia Uniform Mediation Act, as I think probably most of you know, up and if this was done a year and a half ago, we probably wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be commenting on the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act because it only came into effect on July 1st, 2021. But it does uh, have some, in, the, the rules and the act do have some interaction, and I'll talk about this. If this was being done in person, I would ask for some questions about, uh, and ask for hands to be raised of, uh, of who is a registered mediator uh, in the state. And the term, uh, the rules always use the term neutral, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use the word uh, mediator. And I'd ask uh, who serves as full-time uh, neutrals and 
who is registered, who is not registered. And uh, I'd ask participants if they know, uh, who knows the difference between registered and unregistered mediators and uh, know uh, when a registered mediator is required to be used and when one is not. So uh, those are the kinds of questions I would ask and I would, uh, I believe I'd probably get a variety of answers in that. But my goal is to go through these things so that everybody can uh, at least get some understanding of uh, why that's important. And the next slide, please. Yeah. The most important thing uh, and distinction to understand about the difference, <clears throat> pardon me, between the Supreme Court uh, of Georgia's alternative dispute resolution rules and the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act is that the Supreme Court rules only cover certain mediations or the act covers them all. And I'll be explaining why the rules only cover some while the act covers all. The um, next slide. Thank you, Sean. The rules apply only to what are called court referred and court annexed mediations that are done under the auspices of an approved ADR program. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. The court referred as my understanding of that is, is that it that is a synonym for court ordered. Court annexed uh, is a little bit more ambiguous, but uh, my understanding of that is that that is when a mediation is done under the auspices of an existing uh, um, approved ADR program in a circuit or court, and uh, but and where the parties enter into the mediation under that uh, in accordance with that program, but they're not yet uh, quite court ordered. On, in terms of the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act, you'll see on the slide that it refers to both uh, them applying to all uh, mediations, whether court referred, court INX, or what are called private mediations uh, in, in the rules and in other discussions, which means that they're not done under uh, in pursuant to any court approved program and related court order under that. It's important, as you'll see at the bottom of the slide, that the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act, however, although it applies to everything, still does not supplant the Supreme Court's rules, which apply to uh, mediations with her under the auspices of approved ADR programs. And that might be a tad confusing for folks who aren't familiar with all this, but I hope uh, uh, there'll be some clarity on that as I go through my explanation about those, uh, those terms. Um, Sean, if you could go to the next uh, slide. With regard to the rules, the Supreme Court rules, uh, Two questions, why were they developed and then the history of their development? Well, the reason for their development, I'm gonna read, this is a copy of the rules, um, which if you can probably tell, pretty extensive, uh, deal with an awful lot of things. But the beginning, uh, at the very beginning of the Supreme Court rules, it says the Georgia Constitution of 1983 mandates that the judicial branch of government provide, quote, speedy, efficient, and inexpensive resolution of disputes and prosecutions, close quote. And that was something that um, was begun to, uh, be began to be uh, thought about really in the early 90s. But one of the real things that triggered that was the operation, and some of you may be familiar with it, of the Atlanta Justice Center, of which Edie Prim, who's uh, kind of famous within our ADR world in Georgia and really outside of it, 
is the executive director, and she was involved in doing a lot with regard to mediation pre-1990, and of course still is. But um, one of the things that caused uh, caught everybody's eye uh, in the state bar and in the judiciary is that not only in comparatively smaller disputes did mediation work through the Atlanta Justice Center, but it became involved in the much more significant dispute about the highway that was going to run from Atlanta to the Carter Center, which was going to go through some historic neighborhoods, and that caused a lot of consternation and was pretty complex. And Edie was involved in that and successfully got that resolved. And again, that stirred interest in taking a look at mediation or possibly be used statewide. In 1990, the Supreme Court and the State Bar of Georgia formed uh, the Joint Commission on Alternative Dispute Resolution. And that invo involved uh, members of both the Supreme Court and State Bar. And it's, it was tasked with exploring uh, the establishment of an ADR uh, system in Georgia. And it was led by uh, then Chief Justice Harold Clark, who was a real proponent and leader in the field of alternative dispute resolution. The com that commission recommended that the Supreme Court uh, form uh, implement rules and form some bodies to deal with those. And the Supreme Court accepted that recommendation. And in 1993, created the Georgia Commission on Dispute Resolution and the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution. And Sean, if you could go to the next slide. So this is what was the rules, Supreme Court's rules uh, of 1993 created. The Supreme Court's Commission on Dispute Resolution that commission is comprised of 17 members, a Supreme Court justice, a judge of the Court of Appeals, three Superior Court judges, two judges from other trial courts, the president of the state bar, a member of the General Assembly, five members of the state bar, and three non-lawyers. It meets four times a year and has committees of various, uh, with various uh, responsibilities that meet throughout the year when called upon to do so. And I can tell you from the uh, five years that I served on the commission, as Eric had commented, I had been on it. The, uh, I learned from that personal experience, it is really a hardworking group. This isn't something where you're just giving a, given a title that you can be proud of on your CV. It, uh, this, if you're a member of that commission, it does involve a lot of work. The Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution is the executive arm of the commission, and it implement its task with implementing the commission's policies. And our the current director is Tracy Johnson, and the assistant director is Carla Shaw's. And Again, uh, I can tell you that they do a tremendous amount of work. And as I talk through some of the tasks of the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution, you'll be able to understand why I say that. Next uh, slide, please. Well, this is uh, under the rules as they were developed and passed down by the Supreme Court. This is what the commission's responsibilities include. Uh, to administer a statewide ADR program, to oversee the development of ADR programs across the state. And you'll note, I say, encouraged and not required. The Supreme Court did not require that every circuit and court institute a formal ADR program, but it strongly encouraged them to do so. And in fact, uh, that remains the case today. They are courts or in circuits are encouraged to implement them, but they still are not required. The commission uh, also uh, was tasked with developing guidelines to apply to programs. 
to develop criteria for the training and qualifications of neutrals, to establish standards of conduct for neutrals, and also to handle any complaints that might be made against an ADR program or a neutral. John, if you could go to the next slide. The Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution, its director is chosen by the commission. And its responsibilities involve uh, assisting ADR programs that are created in the state. And I'll, as I talk about these later, you'll see they are, they are formal programs that are required to be approved by the GODR. They're uh, tasked with developing training for uh, neutrals. They're tasked with developing policies for the qualification of neutrals to be registered and served in court programs. Uh, they're tasked with developing policies for ADR programs, and they're tasked with uh, registering and the removal of neutrals uh, when removal might be warranted. The GODR also, it's part of its activities recently, in recent years, has developed a statewide case management uh, system that it's made available to programs uh, across the state. And the goal is to help them gather information to track what's occurring in terms of mediation success uh, with regard to how mediation is working. And then also the goal is to provide that information to the commission. So all this uh, is being done to uh, gather more information to help in the improvement of other uh, aspects of what's being done in Georgia. Uh, Sean, if uh, you'll go to the next slide. Again, ADR programs are encouraged by the Supreme Court, but not required. To become an ADR program, uh, it must apply to the Georgia Office of Dis Dispute Resolution and be approved by that uh, entity. And uh, occasionally, uh, and a program will not be approved because it doesn't meet the standards required to uh, to be to serve a circuit or a court. You'll see. <clears throat> pardon me. It says um, there are currently 35 approved ADR programs. I've learned from Tracy Johnson that just recently one more has been added. So there are now 36 approved ADR programs across the state. And they, that it now serving 117 counties in the state with 42 not, uh, not having an ADR program in place. John, if you'll go to the next one. The rules have a number of appendices that uh, relate to some of the formal aspects of operation of programs and also uh, neutrals. This appendices, Appendix A uh, relates to the Uniform Rules for Dispute Resolution Programs. And they apply to courts and established programs, but they don't apply to anything else outside of that. They also apply to what I've already talked about as the court referred and court annexed mediations. They apply to the registration of neutrals and the requirements for that. They apply to the requirement for the use of registered neutrals. And I'm not sure how many may know or may not know, but if there is an existing ADR program, which a court or circuit uses, any mediation conducted in that uh, circuit or court system must use a registered neutral. And uh, that's required, and all the programs keep a list of neutrals that are registered that are permitted to serve in their respective circuit and court. And not all registered neutrals can serve in every uh, existing court program. Another thing that's uh, significant is that ADR programs uh, may enact their own local rules and here in the Augusta circuit, they have enacted local rules and uh, in our, the adjoining Columbia 
judicial circuit, they have as well. And I know other circuits have local rules, but to have those local rules, uh, they have to be approved by the GODR. They have to be submitted, reviewed, and meet the standards that are required. And if you'll go to the next slide. Appendix B uh, deals with the qualifications and training of neutrals. And training programs, and there are a number of them, Tracy sent me a list or, or directed me to a list. If you go online, you can find them. But there are a good number of them, and they um, go throughout Georgia, various cities, Athens, the greater Atlanta area, Savannah, Macon. And um, I haven't counted them, but they're a, a fairly big number. Rome has them uh, as well. As well. So there, these training programs are widely available, but again, they must be approved. And as from time to time, they may be audited. And if they don't continue to meet required standards, their um, approval can be revoked. With regard to the training of neutrals, every neutral undergoes a background check. And that's where you sign the documents permitting the GBI and whoever else to look to see if you've got any criminal background and they, they really do something uh, thorough on that. And there have been, a, I think, a few me, uh, applicants who've been turned down for not passing that. To that person. With regard to training, there is a category, and those of you who are registered will already know this, but for those who may not be familiar with it, the training is outlined on this slide. There's a category called general mediation, which is essentially civil mediation. And that requires 28 hours of classroom training, a 12 hour practicum, or an observation of five mediations totaling 10 hours. And that's required. You, you have to do that to be registered in the area of general mediation. Domestic mediation, if you're going to be registered in that category, you're required to have a VA. You're required to have the general mediation training of 28 hours in the practice, uh, as I mentioned uh, above. And then in addition to that training, you're required to have 42 hours of training that deals with domestic mediation matters, and then an additional 12 hour practice. There is now a new category of domestic violence mediation and a new appendix to the rules that has come into effect in um, January of 2021. And it's domestic violence mediation where you're required to have all the training required in the general category. You're required to have all the training required in the domestic category. And then you're required to have an additional 14 hours of training. And all of these, as of course, is required for you to be registered as a mediator with the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution. There's also a category called dependency, uh, which is you need a BA, uh, all the general training plus 20 additional hours. There's delinquency, which you, is required you're required to have uh, the general training plus 21 hours. There is a category to be registered in arbitration, but you see I put non-binding, uh, and the reason it's non-binding, no court can require that there be binding arbitration. But uh, some, some attorneys and cases do uh, go through it. I've done some myself, as a matter of fact. And it requires for, to serve as an arbitrator in one of those. If you're a panel chief, you have to have five, hour, five years of experience um, uh, as a lawyer. And then if you're a single arbitrator, you have to have five hours as well. And for both of those, you have to have six hours of training and arbitration. You'll see the last category listed there that's in the rules is 
case evaluation slash early neutral evaluation. That is something that was developed in California some a number of years ago. And California was a leader in that. And what is involved in that is um, attorneys will present really a mini trial in a, in a way, mainly through their arguments about the nature of the case involved and then ask a neutral to tell them what he or she thinks about uh, who has the best case and who may win and who may lose. And uh, again, that's done in California a good bit and done elsewhere. Unfortunately, right now in Georgia, it still, uh, that category still exists, but since it requires six hours of training, no training programs uh, are, are undertaking that as of now. And that's because in the past, there wasn't any real interest shown by neutrals in trying to register in that category. But I still think as far as I'm aware, there are there's no training that is offered in that. So it still cannot be, you can't be registered in that category. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, okay. Registration, and I think I've mentioned this earlier, to serve in an ADR program, and it's a formal program that's approved by the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution, a, a mediator has to be uh, registered. And to be registered, you have to undergo all that training uh, in whatever category you want that I just described. So you can't just say, well, I'm a Lawyer, I think I'm pretty good, so I want to sign up to be a registered mediator. It doesn't work that way. The, uh, there is an annual renewal required for the mediator. And I, I see there's a question. Am I saying that to be a registered arbitrator that having, and I lost, the, it, it popped away, so I'm sorry I missed it, but it was a question about Oh, here, oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay. It says, are you saying that to be a registered arbitrator that having done the training is no longer enough? Is it you have to have the five years experience as an arbitrator after the training? To serve as an arbitrator, that's what the uh, rules say. You have to have five years experience. Is it is it five years experience as an arbitrator or five years experience as, 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 a, as, a, as, as a lawyer? As a lawyer. So just just the lawyer, not as an arbitrator. That That's correct. Okay, all right, I'm seeing the responses. Okay, I'm glad that answered the question. Um, the, um, and I think I was talking about the annual renewal. And again, that's required. I might mention as an aside, um, with regard to the number of registered neutrals in Georgia, Tracy Johnson, I asked her this the other day, and there are now 2,994 who have been registered. So there are a lot of registered neutrals in the state. Uh, but she also told me she didn't have an exact number, but many who have sought to be registered have been denied. And that's principally because they've not attended an approved uh, uh, ADR training program or fitness, which I think, of course, means a uh, background check for the most part. The um, continuing education is required three years annually. Up until recently, there was no carryover, but now it's per there's permitted, uh, permitted categories. So, for example, if you attend the annual ADR Institute, um, which is more than three hours, you can uh, throw those other hours in over the next year. There are grounds for removal from registration, and that's conviction or a plea to a crime. If you've undergone some form of professional discipline, if you've had privileges curtailed, and I might mention in connection with that, to be a registered mediator, you do not have to be a lawyer. You. Uh, uh, there are psychologists, for example, that uh, have served and do serve as mediators. And most of the ones I know of do it in the domestic area. But so if, um, if a psychologist, for example, in that capacity serving as a mediator, um, 
happen to have their privileges curtailed for some professional um, discipline, then that, uh, that could cause removal from their response. Also, another thing that can lead to removal from registration is a grievance being filed against the mediator. And when one is filed, uh, the commission and one of its committees, one of its committees initially, gets involved in reviewing that and then making a report to the commission. And if it's found that the grievance is serious enough uh, and that, uh, that it, an adverse decision is warranted, you can be removed from registration and no longer be able to serve as a mediator in any court. If we go to the next one, Sean. Um, the rules provide for both confidentiality uh, uh, aspects of mediation as well as immunity for mediators. And I think we're all anybody that's been involved in being in, in being involved in a mediator mediation either as a mediator or a um, participant. And uh, I'm seeing. That there used to be, uh, uh, there was a point, used to be training for early neutral evaluation. I understand that there was, uh, but uh, the attendance dropped off so that it was no longer, I guess, economically uh, viable. Uh, it what didn't make any sense economically for, um, for the training to continue to be uh, offered. I think there might be some discussion that will be ongoing about how to get around that problem so that people can become registered. But I don't know how many of you, if you are neutrals out there, who've ever been asked to do anything that might be equivalent to a case evaluation, early neutral evaluation. But so far right now, there's still no training and an ability to be registered for that, as far as I know. Confidentiality and immunity. Uh, again, I think anybody familiar with mediations knows that everything that is said there is confidential and can't be shared outside that process. Documents and evidence, uh, also it applies to things that have been prepared for mediation unless they're otherwise discoverable. For example, let's say an automobile accident case and a plaintiff's lawyer brings in an accident report that it, he or she can't say, well, the accident report can't be used now that you've used it in mediation. It's discoverable. So any discoverable information does not provide the confidentiality protection. A neutral is it's provided may not be subpoenaed or it may not re be required to give testimony. The notes or records of the neutral may not be obtained. Now, some years ago, there was one case involved a uh, domestic matter, as I recall, where a judge did make a neutral come in and testify, but there was some, that was, that was kind of a hard fought battle on that. The Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution, uh, there now is a packet of material that if a neutral happens to be subpoenaed, that a neutral can get and use to fight the subpoena. There are exceptions to confidentiality, and I'm going to turn to the rules again and just comment on what they say about that. The, um, some of the exceptions to confidentiality, and some of them, I think, uh, make absolute good sense. In fact, probably all of them. Um, one, an easy one, whether the parties have appeared or not appeared at the Another is if during the mediation, uh, there are threats of imminent violence to self or others, makes sense. If the mediator believes that a child is abused or that the safety of any party or third party a person is in danger, something else that makes sense. And it all, then it goes on to say something a little unique. Confidentiality does not extend to documents or communications relevant to legal claims or dis disciplinary complaints 
brought against a neutral or an ADR program and arising out of an ADR process, documents, uh, communications relevant to such claims or complaints may be revealed only to the extent necessary to protect the neutral or ADO, ADR program. So the confidentiality there can be breached uh, uh, for the purpose of protecting uh, claims against the program or the neutral. That's, that's, uh, that may or may not be important. Immunity. Um, immunity is specifically set out in the Supreme Court rules for a neutral, but there are a couple of qualifications and I'll, I'll just read the rule again on that. No neutral in a court program shall be held liable for civil damages for any statement, act, omission, or decision made in the course of any ADR process, unless that statement, action, omission, or decision is one, grossly negligent and made with malice, or two, is in willful disregard of the safety or property of any party to the ADR process. But outside of those, um, no, nothing can be done in terms of a legal action uh, against a, a neutral during a, an ADR process. And uh, that's a, a, if you're a neutral, that's a good thing uh, because you don't want to have uh, yourself subject to a lawsuit if some party in a mediation, and uh, might, this might even arise more in a domestic situation than in the civil mediation, but uh, gets upset with you. If you can go on to the next uh, slide, Sean. Appendix C, chapter one, ethical hey, standards. Hey, Bray, somebody yeah. asked a, a question, Henry Quillian asked, what is the legal source of the immunity? Is it the, by law? The, yeah, it's the rule of the Supreme Court of Georgia. It's in the rules. So the Supreme that, Court of Georgia says in its rules regarding uh, 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 approved ADR programs and registered neutrals, you, one may not sue them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, by the way, that that uh, that protection uh, is not in the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act. So that might be one reason why neutrals would like to mediate in ADR programs and be registered. Uh, Appendix C, Chapter 1, Ethical Standards uh, for Neutrals. Again, these are established pursuant to the requirements of the Supreme Court that both the Commission and then the GODR work on these things. And again, those of us familiar with mediation, whether as uh, representing parties in them or as a neutral, know that really the principle governing determination in all of these things is self-determination and voluntariness, which, which deals with that the parties are completely free to reach an agreement or not reach an agreement. No judge can make them reach an agreement, no mediator can make them reach an agreement. And that is a key fundamental principle. And mediators are to emphasize that in their opening remarks of the mediation. Again, uh, mediators are required to keep um, keep uh, things confidential and not break those rules. And I see has the immunity rule been challenged in Georgia court? I have I, I do not know, uh, and honestly, I don't know if it's even ever. I have to ask Tracy Johnson. I don't know of any cases where it's come into play. I, I never heard of any when I was on the commission. There may have been some in the past, but I just don't know. But as far as I know, it's not been challenged. And my guess is, since it's a Supreme Court rule governing uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, established system for ADR in Georgia, my guess is that would a challenge to that would not be successful, but I, I don't know. Um, again, the requirement, requirement, the ethical requirement that a mediator keep things confidential. 
another thing that makes sense impartiality and that's an understandable ethical requirement the words fairness and integrity of the process are used in the rules and what what that means that the mediator and the words used is that the mediator or the neutral is the guardian and protector of the fairness and integrity of the process. And what that means is if a mediator comes to a conclusion that somebody might be being intimidated or something that is grossly unfair for whatever reason, the mediator has the authority to terminate the mediation. When I took um, uh, the mediation training, an example was given to me on guarding the fairness and integrity of the process where it was a divorce uh, mediation. And of course the husband and wife sat on opposite sides. The husband was wearing a jacket or sport coat and during the mediation uh, let it slip such that a pistol he had uh, show, was showing uh, that he had in a holster on his belt. Well, that mediation was terminated. Also, if if the mediator would uh, come to a conclusion that somebody was impaired mentally or in, by intoxication, drugs, then the mediator should terminate that mediation. The um, rules of fair practice, that really relates to what a mediator is to do or not do. Uh, one, avoid conflicts of interest and um, certainly bias, any bias that might exist, otherwise exist. But also, uh, there are to be no referrals if in some way a mediator might have some economic interest in, in a, um, in, 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 with a party subsequent to a mediation. No fees may be contingent upon the results of the mediation. It's required that the mediator have competence to mediate the dispute. Uh, there again, though, you might wonder if the mediator undertakes it and doesn't have such competence, you know, is it fair for them to still be um, have immunity? Uh, another aspect of it is truthfulness in advertising. And as you within this appendix, there are a good number of examples that the rules provide hypothetical situations that can be read where after reviewing those, an opinion is expressed in there about what is appropriate or not appropriate. And by the way, while on these uh, rules, a, a comment that I should have mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about the rules and, and the GUMA. Currently, the commission is undertaking through a committee to review the rules and see if uh, where it might be wise to bring them more in line with some of the um, things put forth in the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act. Uh, some, I, I, that one popped up but disappeared before I could fully read it. Do you, do you see it, Erica? No? Okay. So I, I, the expansion of gun carry laws, do you see that example you gave being challenged as non-threatening? Uh, I can't imagine that that would be non-threatening. The, uh, the mediator would conclude, I think any reasonable mediator would conclude that a weapon being visible in a mediation might cause the potential for uh, intimidation and uh, certainly if that happened i would say i'm not mediating this case the mediation is terminated so i would hope the mediators would have enough sense to do that i, I can't imagine that a good mediator would not do that. um <clears throat> pardon me so anyway these rules um there's there's a lot in there as i showed you earlier these are pretty extensive i think there's over 60 pages of the rules, including the various appendices that apply to these things. So there's a lot of uh, meat in there that can help with understanding what is good to do and what's not good to do. If you go to the next slide, Sean. Uh, chapter two, ethics procedures. Um, this um, 
this um, deals with other things that you might think are pertinent. Uh, grounds for discipline are set forth as for mediator misconduct, again, going to, uh, to uh, even to uh, removal from registration is that bottom point uh, mentions, but there are also other levels of discipline, one of which is confidential. And that is uh, where it's regarded that there might have been some inadvertent breach, not intentional, but a breach. And if that's done, uh, one of the things that could be done is a letter of admonition or a reprimand and it's confidential. Also, there can be public discipline. And along with that, um, additional training can be imposed, um, restrictions on the type of mediations they might do require additional continuing education or require mentoring. Suspension is an option and uh, there have been suspensions where uh, a mediator has done something a little more serious that is improper but and recognizes that. And so the, a mediator would be uh, suspended for some period of time, maybe a year or so. And then again, removal. And that can be done for more serious breaches. And there have been removals for violations of various ethical obligations, some of the things I've already talked about. Um, Appendix D, if you'll go to that. Um, this is the new one, as I mentioned, came into effect in January 1 of 2021. <clears throat> Cases not to be referred, what that means is where there is a criminal action pending or where there's a case arising solely under the Family um, Violence Act, those are not to be referred to mediation. Where there is, for any case that is subject to being uh, sent to mediation, screening is required by a variety of folks uh, involved in the in the process. And the key concerns are to make sure, uh, assure safety, assure that there's no coercion with regard to going through a mediation. And discretion, the reason that term is there is an ADR program, those personnel in it have the discretion to say that a, a mediation in a domestic violence situation is uh, will be held or not held. Informed consent by an at-risk party, what that means is the at-risk party should be uh, told, and I don't know whether you, I'm working, I'm doing this from home and my dog Lucy, I think is protecting us from a mail, mail carrier of FedEx. I apologize if you can hear that. But informed consent by an at-risk party, what that means is uh, that the party who is at risk for violence can be informed they can either consent to the mediation or refuse to the mediation. They can't be compelled to go to mediate. And uh, there's a good bit in the Appendix D and there's, a, there's some detailed procedures set out uh, should anybody want to uh, go through and look at that. Myself, I, none of my practice involved domestic mediation, but I'm sure that uh, any number of you on this uh, on this program have been and, and do a substantial amount of that. If you go to the next one, uh, Sean, and I see, uh, I think our time is running pretty good. We're getting close to, you know, uh, some brief comments on the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act. As I've already pointed out, it applies to all mediations. A mediator is not required to be registered to do mediations uh, that are held under that act. But again, if a mediation is done where there's an approved ADR program and uh, court operated when circuit operated, when again, a uh, mediator must be registered and again, the rules require that the participants in the mediation use one of the mediators that are registered in that search. Um, yes, and Erica reminded me, for more information on the Uniform Mediation Act, 
last September, uh, the section did do a full program on that. And so you can go to that and, um, and go to the uh, section materials and see that. And as I think I said earlier, my goal on this was just to make a few brief comments on the act as to how some of it might come into play with regard to the rules that a full program was done on that last September that you might want to take a look at. Additionally, the GODR has sent out a, an email blast on the key provisions of the act and the December 2001 um, issue of the Georgia Bar Journal has a, a pretty significant um, article on that that you might find interesting. The uh, Act has similar confidentiality provisions. There's some different wording and a few different things, but you might want to just read the Act uh, yourselves. It also, just uh, like the rules uh, do, provide for certain exceptions to confidentiality. Many, the same type of things I've, I've talked about in relation to the rules, some of the things that just make walking around sense, really. And but it also then comments that neutrals uh, may not make no reports, assessments, evaluations, recommendation, recommendations, findings, communi communications to a court, administrative agency, or authority that may subsequently adjudicate. Now that language is not in the rules, but I think everybody fully understands that. I have probably done a thousand mediations now. I've never once had a judge ask me anything at all about what occurred in the mediation. And I, I hope that would be true of every mediator because if the judge did that, it would be improper. The, um, the uh, and I'm not sure that I commented on this in, when I was going through some of the other things relating to mediators, but this is something that relates to both the act and the rules. They're essentially the same. Uh, mediators are to disclose any potential or actual conflicts of interest. Mediators have a duty to make a reasonable inquiry uh, to see if there are any known facts that would cause a reasonable person to question impartiality or to affect impartiality. And um, if a mediator mediator is to disclose those things and if a mediator actually learns of such things during the after the mediation is accepted and uh, getting ready to be done if a mediator learns of that the mediator is to disclose those things and that's true both in the act and the rules so that the ethical obligation does exist for the the um, that is it. The um, going to the last slide, Sean. Just a last final comment by me, and then we'll see if there are any uh, any questions, other questions. I think I think you can see in short, uh, going back a long time, even uh, as I said with you, the Atlanta Center Justice Center that Meadie Edi operates as executive director. George has been a real leader in uh, mediation, uh, the rules in the early 90s, and now that's continued through the enactment of the Georgia Uniform Mediation Act. So Georgia nationwide is a real leader in this area. And with that, that concludes my remarks. Do, do we have any questions? You can feel free to either put them in the chat. Um, Couple of, a couple of things. So this has been great, um, Ray. It's been very, very helpful and a good reminder for those of you who are registered going back through. Um, there are advisory ethics committee notes and situations where you can see where things are happening. Um, do the One question we had was, do the Supreme Court rules apply to cases that are in litigation, but where the parties agree voluntarily to mediate rather than through a court order? Uh, as I've said, remember when I talked about court annexed and there's a little bit of ambiguity there, I think, but I think one of the interpretation is that if they agree, even though it's not court ordered, remember it said court referred and court annexed, court referred, 
I take, and I think it's generally understood to be court order. Court referred, uh, uh, court annexed, I would say, and I think maybe, I think most take to be that there is an existing ADR program, approved ADR program, and as long as the parties are in that circuit with that program, uh, it falls under the auspices of that circuit's ADR program, and so the rules would apply. Now, I don't know whether anybody here might have a different interpretation on of that. I think maybe in the rules uh, there might, as there might be updated, there might be a little more clarification added to that because court annexed might be a bit ambiguous, but um, that's that's my understanding of it. So, and I had one question because we've talked about it before is the difference um, with evaluative mediation versus just pure facilitative mediation and how that works um, in under the Supreme Court rules. Sure. And I know we're going to talk about that at the October 20th program a little bit more. But again, I, I'm, I'm assuming there are an awful lot of neutrals that are participating in this who are familiar with the philosophical dispute on evaluative versus um, just facilitated mediation. Um, what, uh, I, what it really comes down to is uh, whether a mediator can be taken to be interfering with self-determination and voluntariness of, uh, of reaching an agreement. The dispute is if a mediator does some evaluation that could adversely affect that voluntariness. Um, and so there's a, there's a philosophical group, uh, group the facilitative that says it's improper to do that. Others will say that if I get, engage in a little bit of evaluation, evaluation it can be in, indirect, for example, if I had your case, I think I'd be concerned about this. That's well, that's as opposed to you ought to be concerned about this. Um, so there are nuances of what might be evaluation also. But I think those who believe in evaluative mediation thinks that it really does help self-determination because it lets the court parties think about what really is at risk, uh, what's really involved, and lets them have a clear clearer picture of things for them making a determination. It's not the mediator saying this is what you have to do or should, must do, but it's the mediator helping them think through risks, benefits with regard to what might be able to be achieved at a mediation. Uh, facilitative, uh, none of that's done. It's just um, you kind of go back and forth between the parties for the most part and share their views, uh, each party's views and let the other side think about it without getting into quite that detail. As a quick aside on that, uh, ABA did a study some years ago where on this and uh, a vast majority of lawyers said they would not hire a mediator who did not assist and did not express opinions. And of course, that would be a value. Okay, so there's a good plug for our October um, uh, meeting. And so I'll first talk about our September 28th uh, meeting. We will have a webinar on Thursday, September 28th. We're going to start it at 1230. So maybe some folks can get some lunch beforehand. It'll be by Zoom. We're going to have Doug Chandler um, and his his colleague are going to be, Dina Stoddard, um, going to be talking about mediating legal malpractice claims, um, which uh, hopefully is all a mystery to all of us, but um, it'll, it should be a really great program. We're really excited about it. And then in October, on October 20th, which is during um, the American Bar Association's Mediation Week, we're going to have a full day program all via Zoom um, in two different sessions uh, talking about various mediation topics, talking about it all day, mediation all day. And so hopefully you will engage with us. I also want to put a plug in for um, the Atlanta Bar Association dispute resolution section. They have an upcoming meeting on September 15th of sort of a get to know you uh, meeting and they have it at 
they're doing this one via Zoom. It's at 8 a.m. Um, so check out the Atlanta Bar Association's website where you might be able to register for that. And that's a really good group of people as well. So um, with barring anything else, we're really excited about September. We're really glad all of you were here. Please reach out to me or any of our officers if there's anything we can do for you or you've got ideas for um, future programs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Sean, for managing the technical aspects. Yeah, and thanks, Sean, for putting this together with Ray. You guys thank were great. I really appreciate it. This was very, very helpful. And Lane, thank you for your help as well. Amen. Okay. So long, everybody. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's meeting. Thank you for joining and have a great afternoon.